Good evening. Uh, our scripture text this evening is from Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Listen, for this is God's holy word. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death. On a cross. This is God's holy word. May the Lord bless the reading and preaching of his word. Throughout church history, there have been some battles over the question of what Christ came to do. Well, we take it from his words himself, he, and he said that he came to seek and to save the lost. And that his blood would be poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But he also said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. So the question that many theologians have fought over is, did Jesus come to die for our sins or did he come to live an exemplary life for us to follow? Well, I believe this is a false dichotomy because the answer is both. He took on human nature fully as he is 100% perfect man without sin in order to die for all of our sins. He obeyed the law perfectly and he also discipled men to walk in his ways as well. But this passage is here not only to show us who Christ is, what he has done on our behalf, but also to show us how we are to live as Christians in the face of opposition and adversity. What we need in adversity is humility in order to remain steadfast in the faith. For the Christian to live a Christ-like life, what we need is the humble mind of Christ and to be united by the Spirit of Christ, not only to Christ, but also, as we have already covered, to one another. So Paul begins this passage with, have this mind among yourselves, the same mind that he has been describing in the last four verses of this chapter. This is the mind that does nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. This is the mind that is humble to count others more significant than ourselves, looking to others not only to our own interests. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. As we are united to Christ, and so this ultimately means we already have the mind of Christ, but we need this constant reminder. And what is this mind? It is a mind of humility. We see here the humility of the incarnation, his birth, and the humility and the humiliation of the cross. So what does it look like to have this mind of Christ? He answers this question by appealing to the essence of who Christ is, his person and his work, what he came to do and accomplish. He says, Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God. Now, let us stop and answer. What does it mean that he was in the form of God? Because to understand what he came to do and what we are to do, we must understand who he is first. Does God have a visible form? Well, no. The scripture says he is invisible. 
It is not speaking of God having a body. Because look what he says immediately following. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So whatever form means, it means that he was equal with God. So this form is speaking of his essence or his substance. In other words, he wasn't a creature. Because no creature can ever be equal with God, neither angels in heaven nor man on earth. And while he was on earth, he claimed to be God. This is why the Jews of his day wanted to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. But he did not count equality with God or being God as something to be grasped. Or or better translated, to be used for his own advantage. But he emptied himself. He he didn't empty himself of his divine essence, his deity, but he emptied himself of his divine right to rule with a rod of iron, completely crushing everyone that opposed him immediately when he came to earth. He set aside that right that he has as God and veiled his glory. From the sight of his people. Except of course for his. Occasional miracles where he displayed his. Divine power and rule. Like when he calmed the storm. Walked on water. And created bread and fish to feed thousands on the spot. And look all of these miracles. And what they were used for. They were used for his people. And his. Glory was shown before Peter, James, and John so they can get a foretaste of what is to come. It was just a foretaste because God knows we cannot stand God's glory without a veil and live. God knows this. He knows we are frail, not only because we are sinners, but also because We are his creatures. And for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. In other words, instead of coming and claiming all that is his, immediately he came in the form or substance of a servant. Even his miracles served his people. Yes, it showed who he was, but in, at the end, it served his people. And then he defines what it means that he came in the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He was incarnated. Uh, oftentimes we jump from here right to the cross, but how often do we sit and think of the beauty? the majesty, the glory, and yet the humiliation of God becoming man, of his incarnation, God's condescension to man and taking on man's substance. When we speak of grace, we are speaking often of his salvation, his work of salvation, but what about the grace of his humiliation, him coming to dwell with man. And as man, he came to serve. That was the purpose of man to begin with. To serve God and to serve neighbor. Yet we have fallen short of the glory of our servanthood. But Jesus didn't regard his deity as the grounds to avoid taking on flesh, rather he set aside and veiled his glory, his majesty, and served his people as the suffering servant of Israel. He lived as a 100% sinless man, living the life we were meant to live. 
He accomplished what Adam did not and could not accomplish. What we cannot accomplish. That is a higher life in heaven with his father for others. For his people. And though we are children of God. We have this privilege. We have been given this privilege. But it's not a privilege that is to be used for our own advantage. How many of us can actually say that we are servants following Christ? Not just following Christ arbitrarily, but servants following Christ. How many of us have fallen for the lies of Christian triumphalism? That we are here to conquer this world and the church is to rule here and now. How many of us can say, even with all the chaos in the world, all the opposition to the church, that I will still live in the world, though not of the world. Mind you, the world was always out there. Even when everyone claimed to be Christians, the world was always out there. And the world was always in here. And always in here. But how many of us will say that I am still here called to serve both God and neighbor just like my master? Despite who the neighbor is. But how did he serve? To what extreme was he a servant? What were the limits? Did he have limits? How was he a servant ultimately? Well, he proved himself to be a servant all throughout his ministry, but there was one ultimate act of service that he would perform on behalf of his people. It is the greatest act of love recorded in human history because it is the love of God for his people. God being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. That is, obedient to his Father's will, to the point of death, even death on a cross. The cross was the common method of the death penalty in Rome, and it was the Jews who who accused him of blasphemy. And then they gave him up to Pilate, and, and Pilate being the politician that he was, he gave the people what they wanted. And handed him over to be crucified. But the cross is not as important as the one who died on the cross. When we preach the cross, we are preaching first Christ who died on the cross. And here he moves from Christ's birth to his death. This is the greatest act of love. And I'll say it again. The greatest act act of love and sacrifice for others ever in the history of man more than any act of sacrifice that anyone has done. Because all the other acts of sacrifice were done by sinners who all need this sacrifice. For as by one man's disobedience, that is Adam, the many were made sinners, so by One man's obedience, that is Jesus, the many will be made righteous. He was obedient to his father. He was obedient to pagan authorities. At the same time, he said, I lay my life down. I have the authority. I do it of my own accord. He was obedient to the point of death. Because he was God and he was laying his life down for others. This would be the pattern of the early church in the first two generations of following Christ. Submission, even if it meant death. In the service of God and in the service of others. Oh, how the guiltless son of God died for the guilty 
all to atone for sin, all for our redemption, all for the ransom that was to be paid for sin, our sin. The center of all Christianity is this very truth. You cannot be saved without it. You cannot have a resurrection without the cross of Christ. This is necessary for the salvation of sinners. You cannot have forgiveness and you cannot enter the holy of holies that is heaven without the shedding of blood. Guiltless blood, not my blood, not your blood, guiltless blood. The blood of a blameless sacrifice on our behalf. And on that day of this sacrifice, God turned his back on his beloved son for us. So that we may enter his presence to stand guiltless. To be treated as though we never sinned against him. What love is this? This is the love we ought to be looking at every day when we wake up. Is the love of the Savior. Not the love we mustered up and shown others. But the love that our Savior has shown to us. Especially when we consider how we've wronged him. Not in the last 24 years, but in the last 24 hours. His life was unique. His death was unique. As he was the unique God of Israel who became the unique suffering servant of Israel. And taking up the cross... And becoming servants is the pattern that scripture calls us to. It's what Paul calls us to. As reformed Christians, we often glory in glory. I'll mention Luther again, as I so often do. But Luther famously contrasted the theologians of glory versus the theologians of the cross. The theologians of glory had their minds caught up in the clouds and they never landed to serve anyone. Versus the theologians of the cross who sought the whole gospel as a ministry for others. It's all for God's glory, we say. And we often slam down that hammer. But have we ever asked what does glorify God? To be servants. To be servants. To share this message of salvation as he desires all people to be saved. To be servants. The Father and the Son were united in one will before the foundation of the world That the son would enter into this world in order to live and die for sinners in a human nature and form. But we look for every reason, even theologically, how we should sit on thrones rather than be servants in this life. How often do we approach the church caring for number one first? With an ultimatum. As long as they serve me, then I'll serve them. As long as the church is heaven in my own image, then I will have fellowship and communion with the saints. Unfortunately, our gathering is just a foretaste of heaven and none of us are perfected yet. But as long as we are living, we are promised these truths. We are promised his spirit. We are promised by faith that we are called to strive by his spirit to have this mind, which we already have, which already ours, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This mind is at our expense to use as we plead with Christ. What does this passage do for us is that it lays down the basis of our Christian conduct. 
both in the church and in the world in humility and love. It would be false to think that if Christ died for us, then we are not to follow his example in the world. Notice nowhere in Scripture does Jesus command his disciples to follow him in his kingly example or in his exalted state in this world. In fact, he says, the greatest among you will be his servant. And a servant is not greater than his master. And if his master was a servant in this world, then how great is the servant of a servant to be in this world? This would conflict with our natural tendency to rebellion. Uh, I grew up hearing the famous words, do it yourself, I'm nobody's slave. Contrast that mind with the mind that Paul calls us to have here. God, our God, took on flesh, and that flesh bore the sins of his people on the cross. This is the basis of our servanthood. This is also the basis of our growth in grace. We can never outgrow the message of the cross. Because the cross of Christ shapes and forms our growth. We often wonder, well, how am I growing in the Lord? Where am I showing improvements or growth? We should ask ourselves, are we growing as servants taking up the cross and following Christ. One of the difficulties is, is that we ask this question of ourselves in an age of obligation where we believe we are obligated to everything, where we want the crown and the throne before the service. But if we are Christians, we are united to Christ, not only his life, but also his death. Yes, we will be exalted with him one day, but for now, we are united to his sufferings. And we do suffer. He regarded himself as nothing and made himself nothing when he died for the sake of others. How much less should we think of ourselves if we claim to love and serve him? By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So as long as we live in this world, we are servants, not glory mongers, seeking our final place in this world. Our war is spiritual and it should always lead us first to our knees. We are children of God through Christ which is the most important status to have in this world. More than anything we have accomplished. Our Father is God himself. What a relief that should be to our minds. Despite all of our failures, he still loves his children. All that you have accomplished in this world will never be as important as this. But it is not to be used to lord it over others, but to serve as the Son of Man came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Not as rebels who only serve themselves, but as Christ because he died for all that those who live might no, no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised. I'm going to read from Romans chapter 15. If you want, you can turn there. If not, if you're a little tired, it's okay. Romans 15, verses 1 through 7. 
gives an example of Christ being a servant and then he applies it to the church. And this can apply to any time and any place and anywhere, even in our own context. It says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So he grounds our servanthood in what Christ had already done for us. In receiving and welcoming us through the sacrifice of his veil, his flesh. In this we ought to rejoice and in this we ought to follow. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven. What humility it is for the God of all creation to take on flesh, your beloved Son, and to die on behalf of us who have never served you as we ought. Pure evil has been on our hearts since our birth, and how often it is so, even as we claim to be yours. Father, forgive us of our sins. Grant us hearts of servanthood. Grant us hearts humble enough to look to others and not only to ourselves. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen.